Good evening and wel welcome to Faith That Works. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, spring weather that we've been having and have had a good week and are ready to get to uh, the study of um, the topic we started actually a couple of weeks ago. And um, we're going to continue the doctrine of the last things, our eschatology tonight, and uh, follow up with it next week. Uh, tonight's topic we'll look at is the second coming of Christ, and we're going to look at some different uh, facets of the doctrines that surround that second coming of Christ, and hopefully uh, once we have finished, you'll have some idea of what the scripture talks about when uh, it talks about the return, and so... Um, we're going to look at the doctrine uh, of second coming and hopefully uh, help you understand that at its very core the conviction uh, that Christ will literally return and establish his kingdom here in a new heaven and a new earth is the very core of what we believe about the last days and the return of Christ. There are several views uh, concerning this return, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, the millennial views uh, as we think about what the Scripture tells us of the return. And uh, we'll talk about two of the major, uh, well, actually one of the major views, uh, premillennialism. And uh, there are two others that we're going to touch on. But basically, uh, most people today um, will have uh, a belief that the millennium is going to come at Christ's return, after, right after Christ returns. And uh, pre-millennialism is that idea of um, the thousand years reign that the Bible talks about when Christ comes back um, at the end of a period called the tribulation. And uh, we'll look at that and see what all that involves also tonight and, and next week. But first we're going to take a short break and um, give you a chance to get your Bible ready and uh, hopefully you'll look along with me at the scriptures that uh, uh, support the concept or the uh, truth of Christ's literal return. So we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. If you choose to obey the power of sin, it leads to death. If you choose to obey obedience, it leads to righteousness. Forgiveness is just the beginning of life in Christ. God wants us to live for him now. And because of Jesus Christ, the gospel was preached, and you and I are blessed today because of Abraham. Did you know that? We're blessed. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. 
The only way we come to know the saviorship of Jesus Christ is by bowing and acknowledging that he is Lord and King over all the earth. Jesus Christ died on a cross, paid the penalty for our sin, and by repenting of our sin and accepting him by faith, what he did for us, we are forgiven. Salvation is not a combination of faith and works. Salvation is by faith alone in God. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back. As we think about the second coming of Christ, we have to think about his um, first coming and his life here on earth to begin with. And um, this week we have celebrated Passion Week. And this is the week that leads up to the resurrection of Christ. Today is called Good Friday. I think they ought to call it Fantastic Friday because of uh, the work that Christ did on the cross uh, there oh, 2,000 years ago as he became the sacrifice for us, for our sins, and created the salvation that God had planned for his people. So that event is one that um, brought about the idea of his second coming. And let me read to you in, in John chapter 14, where Jesus says, Let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. When Christ was resurrected, he died on the cross, was buried, and resurrected from the grave, he went to be with his Father in heaven, went to be with God the Father. And before he left, he told his disciples, uh, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he goes on to say in John, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And uh, we see that that promise is promised to all who believe in him he was talking with his disciples his followers but he was talking to all who would come to know him as their savior and lord and this is a promise that uh, we as christians hold dear to our hearts because it's the hope that we have when we accept christ as our savior which will be come to fruition when we die and, and leave this earth. And uh, we talked about last week uh, the resurrection of the, of the body, uh, which is yet to come after we die. But our souls, our spirits, go to be with God in a place called paradise. And um, this is the hope that we have in what Christ did for us on the cross. The word millennial, then, is a term that is used concerning that second coming that uh, the Bible speaks of. Christ said that he's going to prepare a place, but he's coming back for us, for his very own. And um, that second coming is a millennial reign in which Christ comes back to earth and with the saints that have gone on to meet him, uh, he brings back to earth in what is called a new heaven and a new earth. And Christ reigns on earth in a period of a thousand years peace and um, so as we look at the scripture we really can't find the word millennium millennium means thousand we don't find it in the scripture as such 
It comes from a Latin word meaning thousand and refers to the thousand year reign that Christ suggested in Revelation 20 verses 1 through 7. Let me read this as you follow along in Revelation. Again, it's chapter 20 verses 1 through 7. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now this is talking about all those believers uh, who are, are living during the uh, tribulation. And um, uh, the tribulation period we see that each person will receive a mark that called mark of the beast. And uh, without that mark, there would be no um, trading, no uh, buying of goods, food, or whatever. And so those that um, uh, will not receive that mark, those who believe in in Jesus Christ, will be beheaded. Uh, They'll not live through that time. And so um, they will be with Christ as he comes back to reign for this thousand years. Um, Going on to verse 5, it says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. So last week, as we studied the resurrection of the body, we saw how the souls of both the redeemed and the unredeemed uh, were resurrected. Now, this is called the... um, Um, rapture Uh, as Christ uh, has uh, come back midway to the earth and meets his church midway in the air it says uh, we'll be changed in a moment in a twinkling of the eye and um, the dead in Christ will rise first and then those who believe Now, I got a little bit ahead of myself, but this comes after the, uh, uh, or right before the time of the tribulation, as we'll see in our study of the uh, premillennial views. And um, I think I said that both the dead, uh, unredeemed, and the redeemed will be risen but it's just the the dead who are in Christ and those who believe in him that will be raised in the resurrection or the rapture and um, it says that at the end of the thousand years all will be resurrected with new bodies now The thousand-year reign includes Christ and his church, the redeemed, in a setting of peace and happiness in the new heaven and new earth. The lost will remain in Sheol, which is simply uh, interpreted as the place of the dead or the realm of the dead, where they will continue their punishment for a thousand years. Now, this is not to say that they will be in what I term as 
final hell because they have not yet been judged at what is called the great white throne. This comes at the end of the thousand years. Um, at the end of that thousand years, all will be resurrected in new bodies and we will stand before God. Those who have received Christ as Savior and Lord will be judged according to their works, according to their faithfulness, and will be given rewards that uh, Christ and God has prepared for His believers. The redeemed will be judged rightly, just as those who are unredeemed. The only difference is that, as I said, they will be receiving rewards where those who are unredeemed, those who have rejected Christ as Savior, rejected the salvation that God has planned for all who would believe in Him, will be condemned to eternal punishment. This will be their final hell. They will be cast into the lake of fire and next week we're going to talk about the different terms that uh, identify hell and talk about the different degrees of punishment that will be there just as there are different degrees of rewards for those who have trusted in Jesus uh, those uh, who are unredeemed will receive different degrees of punishment for their unfaithfulness and for the crimes possibly that they have committed uh, according to um, their actions and their work here on earth in a state of uh, lostness. So the Bible describes this punishment in several scriptures and there are several terms used to describe this punishment. Now we're going to look at these different uh, punishments, different terms rather, tonight. The Bible speaks more of hell than it does of heaven. Um, I think possibly that is because God is warning people not to go there. He's calling out to people to put their faith and trust in Him so that they will not have to experience that eternal punishment. We'll see how severe that punishment is in next week's study. But um, look with me as we look at um, Matthew chapter 8, verse 12, as it describes hell as darkness. It says, But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, most of us take uh, our sight for granted. We see things around us and, you know, that's just normal. Several years ago, I was in an accident in which I could not see anything but darkness for several minutes. It was very frightening. Not to be able to see what's going on around me, uh, what was uh, happening uh, at the moment, fear of what the future held in darkness. That's nothing, however, compared to what the punishment of total darkness, eternal darkness, will hold for those who have rejected the light of Jesus Christ. Um, looking on, in the rest of that verse, it says, But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
torment, weeping, um, not just a cry, but weeping um, and gnashing of teeth, gritting your teeth. I can't imagine and don't want to imagine what that is like. Um, another um, term is used in Matthew uh, let's see in Matthew I've lost my place here hold just a moment um, in Jude I'm sorry Jude chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 it says but I remind you though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So what he's saying here is that uh, during this intermediate time when a person dies and between that time and when the thousand years reign is over with, when the uh, bodies will be resurrected uh, of those unredeemed, they will continue to be in darkness and um, receive punishment. Um, in that same New Testament book, Jude Chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, he says, These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. There will be punishment, and all those who have rejected Christ will experience that punishment. No, no unredeemed person will go without being judged according to his punishment. Um, there are those who participate in this eternal punishment. Of course, the unredeemed are uh, the major uh, participants in this uh, state of uh, eternity. But also, we're going to see that their punishment comes because of Satan. And uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 says, The devil who deceived them was also cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beasts and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. During this tribulation period, uh, I think we talked about it a little bit last time, uh, Daniel describes uh, the end times as 70 weeks. And 69 weeks have already happened. 69th week ended with the birth of Christ. And, of course, we're still uh, anticipating the seventh week as tribulation breaks out all over the earth. And this is when the Antichrist 
and uh, the false prophet are loosed and deceive the people. We live in a state of chaos almost in our world today. And it's getting worse and worse. There are many who believe, and rightly so, I think, that uh, it will not be long before uh, the time of tribulation occurs and uh, Christ comes and raptures his church out of this world. But for those who uh, are negligent in their spiritual life and never accept Christ as their Savior because he said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. They are going to be the ones who experience this uh, tribulation. Those who are still alive will uh, be deceived by the Antichrist, the beast, uh, and the false prophet who uh, comes like a uh, wolf in sheep's clothing and people will begin to uh, believe in everything that that person tells them. He is the solution to world peace and prosperity. Then we see that midway through the tribulation, all of that turns to um, punishment. It all turns to persecution. And um, the peace and prosperity will be no more. Second uh, Peter 2 and 4, chapter 2, verse 4, talks about even um, the fallen angels, those uh, we call demons, those who followed Satan and fell from uh, heaven, uh, will be part of that crowd that um, is cast into chains of darkness. Um, it says that, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved from judgment, um, then he will not hold back from those who reject him here on earth. Look at the seriousness of what these verses are saying in Matthew chapter 5 and 30 because it applies to uh, the humans, those who will be left behind. Uh, body and soul. Um, Matthew chapter 5 verse 30 says, And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. He's talking about repentance. Uh, repent of your sin. It would be better if you refuse to repent, that if your right hand offendeth you, cut it off, get rid of it. It'd be better than losing your entire body and soul. Um, Matthew 10 verse 28 goes on to say, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He's talking about Satan here. Uh, we should fear Satan because for the unredeemed, those who follow Satan will follow him straight into the bottomless pit, the lake of fire, uh, that place called hell. Um, Going on with another scripture reference here, Matthew chapter 18, verse 9. says, If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. 
It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into hell fire. Then Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15 says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Death and Hades. Death, of course, we understand. When our bodily functions cease to be. When our heart stops. Our brain uh, stops working. We are dead. Not alive. Hades is the New Testament term uh, for the realm of the dead. What John is saying here is that anyone not found in the book of life, not the one who has not put their trust in Jesus Christ and dies without Christ in their life goes into that um, state uh, or realm of Hades or the place of death or realm of death and all of Hades and death will be emptied into the lake of fire at the end of uh, that thousand year reign and when God pronounces judgment upon those who have rejected him. Well, we're going to take another break here, uh, just a couple of minutes, and then we'll be back, and we're going to talk about um, the effects of this eternal punishment. So join me as we come back in just uh, shortly. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Well, good morning. This is the 7th of June in the Lord's year 2010, and this is day uno, one of webcast1live.com. We will begin with Max World Live with my special guest, Tom Coates, in just a minute. There's Tom. Wait. Howdy. And uh, we will be live for the very first time on Webcast One Live. We're going to look back on this and say, gosh, remember that old day in history? Wonder where Walter Cronkite was. He must have been around hanging there too. But actually, it's the beginning of Webcast One Live. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Rob Spearman and everybody who's put together this project together. And uh, we're ready to go live now. So thanks for listening to MaxWorldLive.com. I can't tell you that it's going real well from time to time, but it is going. All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. 
Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program or log on to transformationstreatment.com. Transformations. Change your life. Change your relationships. Transform your world. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Back in the mid-1990s, somewhere around 95, um, 96, it was reported that a new community that sprang up, a uh, new development um, in a place in Oregon, decided that in that new community, they would place restrictions. And one of the main restrictions that they uh, announced was that there would be no churches allowed, no Christian churches. After about five years in the life of that commu community, they began to beg for churches to come in and build in that community. Now, that seems a little strange, doesn't it? Because if you get God out of the picture, then what can be wrong? You remove the plumb line from a building, and it doesn't matter how you build it. You remove God from society. There is nothing that you could call sin. Everything, anything would go. They soon realized, however, in that community that because they had left God out, everything began to go awry. They began to ask for uh, churches to come in that they might um, have input of God into that community through their work. When the unredeemed leave this world, they will be separated from God. When a person dies, there are no second chances at anything. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, it states that in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So those who reject Christ and leave this world without Christ as Savior and Lord will be eternally separated from God. An eternity without the presence of God, an eternity of darkness, an eternity of punishment, an eternity of agonizing pain and fear. In Luke chapter 12, verses 45 through 48, it tells us, But if that servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come one day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in two and appoint him his position or his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know 
yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. God has given many of us much in our lives. Maybe not of material things, but uh, maybe he's given you uh, an exceptional mind, uh, an exceptional understanding of things around you, of things that you uh, read and study. He's given you an exceptional life, great health, good health, without um, much illness or sickness, without uh, devastating uh, tragedies in your life. Much has been given you. Much will be required. As we talked about a moment ago, there will be degrees of punishment in hell. And uh, just as there are degrees of reward in heaven for those who have believed and have given their lives to the work of Christ and to his testimony, uh, those who are unredeemed will receive punishment in degrees that are worthy of their uh, punishment of their ungodliness. In Isaiah 66 verse 24 it says, And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of men who have transgressed against me. For their worm dies not, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Then in Mark Chapter 9, verses 43 through 48. Mark says, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better to, for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that will never be quenched. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet and to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes and to be cast into hell fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Does that sound familiar? Um, we saw that in uh, another uh, passage of Scripture just a moment ago. Then Matthew 25, verses 44 through 46 states, Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And did not minister to you. Then he will answer them saying. Assuredly I say to you. And as much as you did not do it. To one of these. The least of these. You did it not. To me. And these will go away. Into everlasting punishment. But the righteous. Into eternal life. Now we've already established the fact in earlier studies that we cannot work our way into heaven. But our rewards will be judged according to our works. Uh, how faithful we are to work that God has uh, given us and to which we have committed our life as we have trusted in him and ask him to come into our life and save us and be savior and lord um, god is going to judge us according to how well we have performed in that 
realm. And uh, we look on to uh, 2 Thessalonians, verse 6 through 9 in, in chapter 1. It says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So we'll be separated from God or those who have uh, rejected him and rejected his plan of salvation. They will be separated from God, plunged into the lake of fire, eternal punishment. Well, I want us to talk for just a moment about the rapture event. Uh, we've talked about uh, several things concerning uh, the coming of Christ and the end times, and uh, we've talked a little bit about the tribulation. But I want us to focus right now on that event that is called the rapture. And again, we do not actually see the word rapture in the scriptures. But um, we see the indication of what it means in the Scripture. Um, previously, we've talked about the resurrection of the redeemed in Christ's church. And uh, Scripture tells us how and when this event will happen. Uh, now, we don't know the exact day or time, but it does give us indications of when the season is near, uh, it tells us how we can recognize that uh, his return, his coming, is imminent. In our beginning study, we briefly talked about the timeline in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel talked about the um, 70 weeks of years. Each week represented seven years. And that 69 of those years, as I said a moment ago, uh, culminated in the birth of Christ. And that is believed to be somewhere between 33, 34 A.D. And uh, we see that Daniel divided that 70 weeks into those two periods. Uh, the first 69 weeks culminating in the birth of Christ and then there would be one week left. Um, the last week or weeks of years was put off until God decides to bring to a close the end of the age. Now, what does that mean? The end of what age? Um, Christ, in his coming, established what is called um, by most theologians, most Christians, as the church age. Because he, as he prepared to leave this world in uh, preparation of his church, he told his disciples to go into all Jerusalem, go into all the world and make disciples. And he began the what is called the church age as he sent those disciples out with the gospel, the good news of his salvation that they might uh, be in turn a part of that church, the church universal. Now I'm not talking about 
the religion of universalism. I'm talking about the church universal as being um, all Christians around the world. We have local churches, um, different denominations even, but we're talking about here the uh, universal church, all Christians from around the world. And uh, the rapture is the event in which Christ comes down from heaven and the Bible says there will be a loud trumpet sound and the dead in Christ will rise first out of the graves. Now, we've talked about already that when a person dies, he goes to be with Christ, be with God in paradise. Well, we're talking about his spirit. Now, the rapture is talking about the body. And generally, most theologians believe the rapture is a separate event from that event of Christ's actual return all the way to the earth, that event which uh, will begin the thousand years reign. And that will uh, occur after the seven years of tribulation. Now, there are three major views of millennialism in, with their variations. And these are in correlation to the last seven-year period uh, referred to as the tribulation. And we'll discuss the tribulation later in our studies, but the following are the three major views of the millennial. And the first view is ah millennialism. And the ah means no or nil. <laughs> means that there won't be any uh, millennial reign uh, as such. Um, proponents of this view espouse the concept that there will be no kingdom age a thousand years here on earth before the end of the conflict known as Armageddon. But the idea of kingdom reign must be expressed in future eternity terms when talking about all millennialism. Um, the followers of this concept interpret the book of Revelation and other prophetic passages symbolically. Uh, they don't believe that uh, John's words that describe the vision that he received from God were actual. They were just symbolic. And... Um, the millennial reign, then, is not a literal reign, but rather represents the lordship and reign of God in the hearts of believers only. It's just a, a symbolic reign that uh, occurs within the uh, commitment in the heart of each believer uh, trusting in Jesus Christ. The view allows for the coming of Christ then at, at any time. There doesn't have to be a, a tribulation period according to the all millennialist. The view was introduced by Augustine in the 4th century and was the dominant view for over a thousand years until the Reformation. Now, <clears throat> we can see several problems with this view and and frankly there are not very many people who still believe in the view of all millennialism because scripture clearly talks about that millennial reign um, also there was a view of what is called post millennialism this view was strong during the late eighteen hundreds all the way up to World War I, but is rare today. Um, very few also believe in post-millennialism. It's stated that through missions and aggressive evangelism, the world will 
continue to get better and better and will be one to Christ. Jesus will come to reign in believers' hearts and thus in the world so thoroughly that a thousand-year reign of Christ on earth will be ushered in. At the end of the thousand years, Satan will be defeated and Christ will inaugurate a new heaven and a new earth. Well, folks, do you see the world getting better and better? Look at the news. Follow uh, the politics in our own country. <laughs> Follow the politics in our own state. The world is not getting better and better. It's getting worse and worse. And anyone that um, has eyes, ears, uh, any concept of understanding can see that the world is not getting better and better. Uh, Post-millennialism, I think, uh, is way off base. Well, what millennialism is left? Premillennialism. And I know that there are several who in this day and time um, are moving away from the concept of premillennialism, uh, especially some of our younger uh, preachers and pastors uh, uh, who have um, their own interpretation of what the Scripture says. And most of us interpret Scripture on our own. Um, but what does Scripture say? Premillennialism is the view that interprets prophecy and revelation in much the same way as did the Christian church from the New Testament period up to Augustine. Now, Augustine was, I think, about 4th century. It holds that God's people will grow in strength, but Satan's power also will become more evident. Uh, we see um, churches that are growing. I remember, now this is going to really date me and tell you uh, my age, but I remember back in the early 1950s where there was a slogan by one of the um, denominations that stated a million more in 54 well, we've seen that denomination continue to grow and grow and grow um, to almost 15 million followers of Christ uh, as a part of that denomination. But in the same token, we've seen Satan's power become more evident in the lives of people. Look at the world news, look at our own uh, United States, American uh, society. We hear of uh, shootings, shootings in schools, children killing children, um, adults who are perverted, who are molesting and killing children. Murdering, thievery, perversion, Satan's power manifested in the lives of people, becoming more evident every day. And we see that uh, in the resulting, um, in the end time, a literal antichrist will arise and deceive the world. As the world continues to grow um, more perverse, more dangerous, there will arise that antichrist who will deceive the people into thinking that he has the solution to world peace. The false prophet will arise and people will equate him with God. Folks, we can see that in our world already in this day. And many will follow him. They will follow 
both the Antichrist and the false prophet, resulting in terrible persecution of those who remain faithful, those who have been redeemed in Christ, then God will use the Jew again in a way in which the Bible doesn't reveal to us at this time that they will be saved by grace through faith just as the Gentiles have been and are. A literal seven-year period of great tribulation will begin, through which the church will suffer. That's right. Uh, Premillennial view is that, uh, in general, is that the church will go through that tribulation period and will suffer, but they will be Uh, rescued from the tribulation. Um, At the end of that time, Christ will return and believers will rise to meet Him in the air. This is talking about the rapture. Christ will defeat Satan in a literal battle of Armageddon and establish a literal thousand-year reign. At the end of that period, Satan will gather his forces for one last assault on God and will be defeated. Um, Satan will be bound for a thousand years as Christ uh, reigns with his church, his redeemed here on earth in a a period of peace and prosperity, of uh, worship, At the end of that thousand years, however, Satan will be unbound. He'll be released. And he will wreak havoc upon the world in his last stance against God. But we know the last chapter. He will be defeated. And then comes the judgment. and the establishing of the new heaven and new earth. Well, we live in scary times for those who do not profess Jesus Christ as their salvation, as their Savior and Lord. It should be extremely scary. For the Christian We should have hope in what is coming. The fulfillment of that salvation that God has prepared for all of us. Remember, Jesus told his disciples, uh, let not your hearts be troubled. In other words, fear not. Because I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will return for you. For where I am, there you shall be also. God has promised us. He's given us the hope of glory in Jesus Christ. He is our assurance that when we leave this world, we will go to be with Him. An eternal glory, worshiping at the feet of Jesus. But those who reject him, I say again, will be cast into the bottomless pit, the lake of fire, the realm of eternal darkness, the separation from God, and will experience untold, unimaginable, punishment, pain, and agony for eternity. How long is eternity? Forever and ever and ever and ever. I hope as you go into this weekend, this time of celebration, Easter, when we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Uh, Today, as we celebrate 
his event on the cross where he gave his life. He, it wasn't taken, but he gave it as sacrifice for us who should have been punished because of our sin. But God had a plan through his son, Jesus Christ. As Jesus hung there on that Friday, his followers thought that is the end. But hallelujah, on Sunday, three days after his death, Jesus rose again to the glory of God. And his church was established for those who believe and follow him. I hope you will experience the fellowship that belongs to God. I hope you will receive Christ into your heart as Savior and Lord if you haven't already. And let us all rededicate, recommit our lives to Christ in order that we might fulfill the destiny of that God has prepared for each of us. God has a plan for every human being, for every person. Follow Him. Accept Him. So that you can receive eternal life with God, with Christ, when we leave this world. I'll see you next week. May God bless you. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live.